Today, we are visiting a field in Peoria County to see a grade stabilization structure and a waterway built late last fall. The grade stabilization structure and the waterway are now in place and functioning and the grass is starting to come in. But last fall, this site looked quite different. Up in the field, you saw ephemeral erosion and here near the field's edge, there was a classic gully. On this site, you can see the landscape all slopes down to a draw. When it rains, if more rain falls than can soak into the soil, runoff water collects in the draw as it flows toward the edge of the field. When water concentrates, it can take the soil with it, causing erosion. We installed a grass waterway to address the ephemeral gully erosion caused by the concentrated flow of stormwater. At the end of the waterway, a grade stabilization structure was built to provide a stable outlet for the waterway and to address the classic gully at the edge of the field. The berm collects the stormwater into a basin at the edge of the field. Water can then temporarily collect in the basin when it rains and be released slowly in a controlled manner through an outlet pipe to a stable point downstream. The berm and pipe together form the grade stabilization structure. There are a number of different types of grade stabilization structures. Rock chutes, block chutes, and tow walls are a few examples. However, when the gully being stabilized has a relatively small contributing drainage area, as this site does, it is sometimes possible to solve the problem using a less expensive alternative. In this case, the structure was designed using the criteria for a water and sediment control basin, or WASCOB. Let's see how one is built. This project started with clearing the site of vegetation and debris. Vegetation performs many useful functions we don't want to lose, so clearing is limited to what is needed to build the practices. Preparing the site is critical. It's important to remove vegetation and debris from the work area. The earthwork needs to have a good connection to the natural ground, and we don't want vegetation and debris to end up in the fill. The berm we're building needs to be able to withstand any storm events that might happen. The material moved in to build the berm was compacted layer by layer to make sure that the berm ends up being as strong and cohesive as possible. Once the site is cleared, a trench is dug for the installation of the outlet pipe. The outlet pipe, using solid dual wall material, is installed in the trench. Dual wall pipe is made essentially with two pipes in one, an outer wall that is corrugated giving the pipe strength and preventing it from being crushed by the weight of the berm, and an interior wall that is smooth. The smooth interior helps make sure that the pipe will allow as much water through as possible without adding resistance to the flow. Periodically, the contractor takes survey shots to make sure that they are at the right elevations. Two anti-seep collars are installed along the outlet pipe. The anti-seep collar helps prevent water in the soil from piping, finding its way along the outside of the pipe. Water moving along the outside of the pipe can cause the berm to erode from the inside and eventually fail. Here we have an animal guard. It is installed at the pipe outlet to prevent animals such as raccoons and possums from crawling up into the tile and building a nest or getting stuck. A pipe can be an attractive place for an animal who doesn't realize that this is where the storm water will be flowing. Besides being bad for the animal, blockage in the pipe can cause water to flow over the top of the berm, which can cause the structure to fail. You saw the pipe go in earlier. Now we need a way for water that will pool behind the berm to get into the pipe. So they are installing a special type of inlet called a riser. The riser basically connects the underground outlet pipe to ground level, where all of the water in the basin can drain. The riser has holes that allow water to flow in while keeping debris out. Once the outlet pipe, anti seep collars, and riser are in place, the trench is backfilled and compacted, taking particular care around the riser. Here they are using both an excavator bucket and a walk behind compactor. It's especially important to make sure that the soil is compacted around the pipe to prevent water from seeping around the outside of the pipe. With the plumbing in place, the contractor can begin building the berm. Material for the berm comes from the channel at the toe of the berm, the basin area, and adjacent locations identified in the design. Earth fill is added in lifts, or thin layers, and compacted. Even though the soil is compacted, the berm will settle over time. So the berm is built 5 to 10% higher than the desired final height, 
The actual percentage of overbuild depends on whether equipment with tires or tracks will be used. Machinery with tires is capable of providing more compaction than tracked machinery. It takes quite a few trips to bring enough earth fill material to build the berm, and you can see the knob near the edge of the woods disappear as the berm takes shape. As the contractor is borrowing material and tying the berm into the higher ground on either end of the berm, he is also shaping the land to blend it into the existing topography and fit it into the landscape. Blending or smoothing borrow areas also helps make sure that those areas remain stable, avoiding erosion problems of their own. After the berm is built, the operator spreads topsoil and fertilizer over the areas that have been disturbed. The berm will need some vegetation to hold the soil in place. The topsoil and fertilizer ensure that the soil is productive enough to grow the grass that will be planted on the berm. It was December when construction finished, so this berm was stabilized with a dormant seeding and mulched with straw. Moving uphill from the grade stabilization structure, construction of the waterway started with the installation of a perforated tile line, which is offset from the center line. Water will sometimes flow very fast and full in the waterway. If the tile were installed in the center of the waterway, it might actually wash out due to erosion of the soil over the newly placed tile line. Instead, the contractor installs a tile offset a specified distance from the center line. In this location, the tile will drain the waterway, but not be susceptible to erosion and scouring that might occur down the center line. Tile is fed from a spool into the slit using a tile plow. The shank of the tiler slices through the soil, depositing the tile at the desired depth, creating a well-supported surface for the flexible plastic tile and then automatically closes the slit as the plow goes along. Over the course of the winter, the ridges created by the tiling machine will settle. Why is drainage tile needed for the grass waterway? This particular site has soil that will not maintain a good stand of grass unless it has a little help with drainage. The tile helps dry out the soil enough to grow the grass essential to hold in the soil in place. With the tile in the ground, the contractor shapes the waterway using a dozer. This waterway has a parabolic cross-section. The shape of the waterway is important. It controls how fast the stormwater flows. The designer makes sure that the water will flow fast enough that it won't silt in, but not so fast that it will erode the soil. Here, the contractor is checking the waterway to make sure the depth, width, and slope are correct. The waterway needs to have a positive downhill grade so that the stormwater will flow evenly and not pool in the channel. After the waterway is completed, it is important to get a good stand of grass established. Grass is a key part of the design of the grass waterway. The grass holds the soil in place and prevents erosion. Once the practices are built and the grass established, the heavy lifting on this practice is finished. However, for a conservation practice to perform well over time, the work doesn't end with construction. Operation and maintenance is key to how well a practice functions throughout its design life and beyond. For instance, tillage and planting of crops in the field should be done perpendicular to the waterway. Planting and working the soil in the same direction as the waterway often results in water flowing along the outside of the waterway instead of into the grass. This would lead to erosion. Avoid overspray of herbicides into waterway vegetation. Herbicide unintentionally sprayed onto the waterway can damage or kill vegetation. The height and density of the grass in the waterway is part of the waterway design. Once the grass is established, it needs to be mowed at the height specified in order for water to flow slow enough that erosion doesn't occur, but fast enough to prevent sediment from dropping out in the waterway. Reviewing and following the operation and maintenance plan for any conservation practice is important. Building the grass waterway and grade stabilization structure involves a number of steps, from clearing the site, installing the pipe, doing the earthwork for the berm in the waterway, to establishing a good stand of grass. All conservation practice implementation, including those practices, begins with sound conservation planning to make sure that the project will work for the site and for the farming operation. And with good maintenance and proper cropping practices, this waterway and structure will be out on the landscape conserving soil for many years to come. If you would like more information on these practices or have other conservation questions, contact your local Natural Resources Conservation Service or Soil and Water Conservation District office.